mentioned, today is the first Sunday in Advent. Uh, there's no biblical mandate uh, for us to celebrate Advent, uh, but it is a season that many churches celebrate as a time for us to focus in on the coming of Christ and what that means, what that provides for us, what his birth meant to us. Uh, the word Advent, it, it's a Latin word, and it means arrival or someone, it's a beginning of something. And it, it really it, it points to the arrival of a significant person or a significant event. And that's really what the Advent season is about. Not just any arrival of any significant event or any arrival of any significant person, but the most significant person and the most is significant event in all of history, that time when God stepped into human history. That's what the season of Advent, Advent looks forward to and celebrates. And during that time, we, we generally will set aside the four Sundays before Christmas and we'll celebrate a, a specific theme on each one, a specific thing that we, that we look at and focus on. And this is something that we want to look to to say the coming of Christ has made this a reality in our lives, these four Sundays prior to Christmas. And the themes are hope, peace, joy, and love. Those things that are ours that we can experience in a very real way because of the coming of Christ. And so we'll start this morning. This is the first Sunday in Advent. This The theme for this Sunday um, is the theme of hope. And over the next four Sundays, we're going to look at these different themes and what they bring, what the birth of Christ, how it enables those things uh, to be in our lives. And so this morning, take out your Bibles, turn in Romans chapter 15. We're just going to focus on one verse this morning. Romans chapter 15, verse 13 is where we're going to be spending our time. Um, and in this verse, the 13th verse of Romans chapter 15, it really is a prayer. And the way it reads that Paul is offering it as a prayer on behalf of the people. And what he's praying is that the people of God would, would experience God's peace and his joy, his power, and specifically his hope. That not only would it just be a reality in their lives, but it would overflow in their lives. And as we look forward to the, the birth of Christ, we look forward to what that brings. We see the, the promise of this overflowing hope that can be real in our lives. You follow along with me. I'm just going to read that one verse, Romans chapter 15, verse 13. He said, now may the God of hope fill you with all joy and peace in believing so that you may abound in hope. By the power of the Holy Spirit. The way Paul prays that prayer, the way he kind of structures it and the way he, he lays it out, he, he first kind of focuses on where this hope comes from, the source of the hope. And, and it's not hard to see in, in his prayer there what he's identifying as the source of hope. We, the God of hope, he said. There are a lot of things in this world that promise hope, right? We, we, sometimes people will look to, to money and say, if I just had a little more money, that would give me more hope in this world. Or we might look to, to our careers and promotion and say, I'll have more hope once I pass that gate in my career. I get that promotion, that next thing, that will give me more hope. Other people look to relationships. It, it's that relationship. That's where I'm going to find hope in this world. That's where I'm going to find hope in this life. But here's what we find out in all of those circumstances. Just as soon as we get that next raise, we realize very quickly that that money now is not enough. It's, it begins to, to dissatisfy us. Now we're looking to the next one. As soon as we get that next promotion, we say, that was, that's where I was going to get hope for my career. That's where I was going to get hope to be fulfilled. And as soon as we have it, shortly thereafter, then we start to get dissatisfied with that. Boy, this wasn't what I thought it was going to be. The relationships, too, just about as soon as that honeymoon period wears off, then we start to really sort of see each other in a relationship, how we really are. And there's, there's some areas of dissatisfaction, right? We, those things promise hope, but they never deliver. They never come through. They're mirages of hope. You've driven down the road, no doubt, maybe in a long stretch of highway, and you see off in, off in the distance, it looks like there's water or something there on the road. It's not. It's a mirage. Once you get up there, it's not there. It has evaporated. The image is gone. That's what the hope that these things in the world, they, they, they promise hope. But they're mirages of hope. And as soon as we come up on them, the hope that they promised has, has evaporated. It's disappeared. But, but here's the, what Paul calls us back to. 
the source of hope that enables, that enables it to be there, not just today, but tomorrow and on into every day. That when we don't know what he's doing, and we don't know where he's working, or why he's working, or why he's not working, or what is taking place, when we don't have the answers to the things in this world and, and why they're going on, we don't know who and what and where and why. We know who. But we can trust in the God of hope, that God who is working all things together for the good of those who love him, called according to his purpose. We put our hope in him, not in the things that we see around us, not in the experiences that we have, not so much in what he does, but in who he is. Because let's be honest, we don't always understand what he does. We don't always understand his timing. We don't always understand where he's working or, or why he's working in a specific way, but we can come back to the person of God. That's where our hope is found. That's where it's, it's grounded and solid in this God of hope. Now, this is the first Sunday in Advent, and we're focusing, we're beginning to look toward the, the birth of Christ, and how is it that the, the birth of Christ is, is what reminds us of the God of hope? That God is one that we can hope in, that it won't waver, it won't move if we put our hope in him. How is it that the birth of Christ can give us this kind of hope? Let me ask you this. What is the oldest promise in the Bible? The Bible's trivia quiz. What is the oldest, the very first one that God made in the Bible? It's okay to start studying your shoes at this moment. Say, you know what, I'm going to, let me just look, look, I'm very prayerful at the moment. What's the very first one? So keep your finger there, Romans chapter 15, I'll give you the answer. Turn back to Genesis chapter 2. Genesis chapter 1, Genesis chapter 2, those are all the creation accounts. Genesis 2, you remember, sort of an expanded version of the sixth day of creation. And, and in the course of that, God makes a lot of statements to Adam and Eve, Genesis 1 and 2. And he talks about, here's, here's how the garden functions and these trees and these plants, and they're going to produce fruit, and then you go, go forth and be fruitful and multiply. But those are all instructions on how things are to function. Here's, here's sort of the operating manual for life and the operating manual for the Garden of Eden, right? That's Genesis 1 and 2. Genesis 3, of course, we read about the fall of man. And in verse 15 of Genesis chapter 3, in fact, look back for a minute at verse 14. Notice who he's talking to. The Lord God said to the serpent. And then down in verse 15, I will put enmity between you and the woman, between your seed and her seed. He shall bruise you on the head and you shall bruise him on the heel. The very first promise in Scripture. There it is. And, and here's the promise. He's talking to Satan. I think it's significant for us to notice that, that the very first promise made in Scripture was to the enemy. And here is his promise. He said, one is going to come, the Messiah, my son. And here's the promise, enemy. He's going to crush your head. That's the promise, the very first one in Scripture. Certainly not a, a promise that the, the enemy was eager to see fulfilled. And certainly you can see why at the birth of Christ, why he moved in the heart of King Herod to, to destroy all of the, 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 the baby boys, two years old and younger, because he knew this promise was going to be fulfilled. Not one he was eager to see happen. We were talking at our home group this, this past week about how old the earth is. And we've been, we're in an apologetic series. It's called Why I Believe, and we're talking about creation. We did four weeks on, on the creation accounts. And the question came up as we were discussing how old is the earth. Well, spoiler alert, we don't really know that. The Bible doesn't say that. It's one of, those, one of those bits of data that, boy, we would really like to know the answer, but we really don't know the answer. I think a conservative estimate would be somewhere around six to 10,000 years old. The evolutionists and their thoughts aside, is the conservative estimate from a biblical perspective would be six to 10,000 years old. Now, now think about this. How many things, even if we look at the most conservative estimate, 6,000 years, how many things have happened in the last 6,000 years? I mean, how many people have lived and walked the earth in the last 6,000 years? And how many events through the course of their lives have taken place over that period of time? And how many animals have, have walked the earth? And how many things have taken place in the stars that, that are in the sky and the ones that have burned out and all of the planets and all of the galaxies and all of the time they have been spinning in the last 6,000 years? How many of that, those things have taken place? And here's the reality. God's kept up with all of them. 
He knows all of them. He knows the very thoughts of our heart. And you and me, you and me and every person that's ever lived, he knows every one of our thoughts, everything that we have ever done. And every animal, he knows when one sparrow falls to the ground. And every one of them, through all of the time that the earth has been spinning, he's kept track of every one. And every star, he knows them all by name. God has kept track of every one of those things. Now, here's how the birth of Christ gives us a tremendous hope. God made this promise way back at the beginning, some 6,000 years ago. And all of that stuff that has taken place over that course of time and in the midst of keeping up with that god never forgot his promise he never forgot that promise was always right there forefront of his mind and every promise he has ever made we can look back to this one promise and say the very first one he made and then he had to keep track of all these things that took place in the universe and it never slipped his mind it never was something that that fell oh yeah i forgot that fell through the cracks i forgot to take care of that one thing. And now look back at Romans chapter 15 for a minute. Romans 15, and jump on up there to verse 4. And he said, for whatever was written in earlier times. Now, of course, he's, he's writing to a church in the first century. Earlier times, what was written in earlier times, so that that's just the Old Testament. We have both, the Old Testament and the New Testament. He's pointing back to the Old Testament for them. And he said, whatever was written in earlier times, that's stuff that you was written about was written for our instruction, so that through perseverance and the encouragement of the Scriptures, we might have hope. And he says that we were told about that first promise, that first promise that he was going to send one, the Messiah, his son, that would crush the head of the enemy. We were told about that promise, and all the rest of them through the Old Testament, for that matter, and for us, all the rest of them throughout the New Testament. We were told about that promise, those promises for encouragement, and for what else? hope that when we see those happen we now we now read in the new testament that that took place and we see that and we say this god is a promise keeping promise remembering god when all those other things in the world the hope from them evaporates the hope that i have in this one the hope that he promises will not evaporate he's never forgotten the promise I forget stuff all the time. He's never forgotten one of them. And certainly we can say if he can be trusted to keep a promise that big, keep a promise that big and for that long as as he's keeping up with all of these other events, if he can be trusted to do that, well, he can be trusted to keep the promises that he's made to you and me every day on a regular basis. Certainly those promises are not as big and longstanding as this other one that he has made. And we often say, you know, make your promises sparingly and keep them faithfully, right? That's, that's, that's a good mantra to live by. But here's the reality. In my life, anyway, I have to make promises sparingly because I'll forget them regularly. And, and there's an incredible source of hope for us. I say that that happens to me. It's not that I want to forget the promises that I make. It's not that I don't want to keep them, right? But things happen, and they become overcome by events. And before you know it, we see each other again. It's, ah, that's right, I promised I was going to do that. And stuff happens, and I forgot, and I didn't do it. Things just become overcome by events. But Christ's birth gives us the confident assurance that this God of hope is a, is a promise-making, promise-keeping God. That he doesn't forget. His promises are are never overcome by events. We want to look to a source of hope in this world. One that is not moving. One that is not changing. One that is reliable today and tomorrow and always. We look to the one who called you who is faithful, Paul said in 1 Thessalonians 5. The one who called you is faithful and he will do it. We have an incredible source of hope and that source of hope is God himself. And it's a sufficient hope. It's a hope that that covers everything, covers everybody. There's no no corner of this world this hope doesn't reach to. There's not something that could come up that God would say, well, my hope only lasts this long. The account has run dry. I'm sorry, now you're, you're overdrawn. That doesn't ever happen. It is a sufficient hope. He said there in verse 13, that may the God of hope fill you with all joy in believing so that you will abound in hope. Abound is not a word that we use very often. It sounds so proper, right? We don't use that word, well, abound in hope. It's not something that we use very often. 
It means to overflow. It means that hope is not just there, present in our lives. It is overflowing in our lives. That's what the word means. And I think this takes on a special significance when we realize who Paul was writing to in this letter. Now, obviously, it's got its title. It's to the church in Rome. It gets that from chapter 1 where he, he's speaking to those he's writing to in Rome. Verse number 7, he said, to all who are beloved of God in Rome. No doubt he is, he is speaking to, he's writing to believers who are there in the church in Rome. And then chapter 1, verses 5 and 6, so right before he says that, he says this to them. Through whom we have received grace and apostleship to bring about the obedience of faith among all the Gentiles for his name's sake, among whom you also are the called of Jesus Christ. And you get the sense when you read his sort of salutation, his opening to the letter, that the church there in Rome was made up of primarily Gentiles. Now, he references the Old Testament a lot throughout the, the book of Romans. In fact, he focuses in chapter 4 almost exclusively on Abraham. And so no doubt there were Jews in the church, but the audience was primarily, the church was primarily made up of Gentiles. Now, why does this give us the, this idea of the sufficiency of hope, a, a special significance? I said it, it kind of it makes it a little more meaningful when we understand who he was writing to. Why does it do that? Because he said this in Ephesians chapter 2, verse 12. He said, remember that you were at that time separate from Christ, excluded from the commonwealth of Israel, strangers to the covenant of the, of the promise, having no hope and without God in this world. And he was talking to Gentiles. They were separated from God. There was the, the covenants that God had made. He made with Israel. He did not make with the Gentiles. They had no hope. In this world, they were a people without hope. And then look at verse 12 of Romans chapter 15. Here is quoting Isaiah, Isaiah chapter 11. He's quoting there. And he said, there shall come the root of Jesse. Of course, he's talking about Christ, the coming of Christ. And he who arises to rule over the Gentiles and in him, the Gentiles shall hope. They were a people without hope. A people to whom God did not make his covenants. They were without him in this world and ultimately without hope. And the coming of Christ means that they now have hope. It, there is a sufficiency to this hope. I mentioned last week how excited I was that we put up our Christmas tree. The other thing we did as we put up the Christmas tree, I can't remember if we did this while we were putting up the tree or after we did it, but we watched the greatest Christmas movie that has ever been made. Now, I know you probably have some thoughts when I say that. You probably have some thoughts about what that movie is. And you might think about things like Silver Bells, and that was a great movie. Or you might think uh, maybe Miracle on 34th Street, and that was a great Christmas movie. You might think about, um, what's the one with Jimmy Stewart? It's A Wonderful Life. You might think about that. You might think those are, those are great Christmas movies. And you, when, when you think about the greatest Christmas movie ever made, you might think about those. But I'm going to tell you this morning, you're wrong. It's not any of those. But in my, I believe the greatest Christmas movie ever made was a Charlie Brown Christmas. And don't scoff. Don't scoff at Charlie Brown. Don't roll your eyes at Charlie Brown. What's the usual message of Christmas movies? Maybe, maybe reunited with family members. There's a relationship that's broken and rebuilding that relationship. Or reconnecting with Long lost friends. Maybe that's a theme of a lot of Christmas movies. They're genuinely being nice to one another. And there, there, is a, there is a group of people that looks to Die Hard as a Christmas movie. And maybe the theme of the Christmas movie would be a, a gun-wielding Bruce Willis saving the day. And all of those things aside. And don't get me wrong, I'm a big fan of all of that. I'm a big fan of reconnecting with, with family members and rebuilding broken relationships. And I'm a big fan of reconnecting with folks you, you haven't seen in a while. I'm a big fan of generally being nice. Not so much I'm sure I'm a fan of a gun-toting Bruce Willis. But nonetheless, I'm a big fan of all of those things. But that's the usual message of Christmas movies, right? You remember the Charlie Brown Christmas? There is that, that scene. Charlie Brown is struggling with what is going on at Christmas. He doesn't quite understand it. And he, and he cries out, can't somebody tell me what Christmas is all about? And the spotlight focuses on Linus, and he quotes there Luke chapter 2. He says, there were in the same country shepherds, a 
abiding in the field, watching over their flocks by night. And lo, the angel of the Lord came upon them, and the glory of the Lord shone around them, and they were sore afraid. And the angel said unto them, Fear not, for behold, I bring you good tidings of great joy, which shall be to all people. For born unto you this day in the city of David is a Savior, which is Christ the Lord. And this will be a sign unto you. You will find the baby wrapped in swaddling clothes and lying in a manger. And suddenly there was, was with the angel a multitude of the heavenly hosts, praising God and saying, Glory to God in the highest and on earth, peace among men. And then Linus turned to Charlie Brown and he said, And that's what Christmas is all about, folks. Now, you can, we can look at all those other movies and be entertained by them, but this is the only one that gets it right. This is what Christmas is all about. And did you notice who the angel said this good news would be for? All people. This is great news, good tidings of great news, which shall be for all people. This hope that the coming of Christ brings is a sufficient hope for all people. There was no one who was out of the reach of God's hope. No one who was out of the reach of Christ's coming and what that, what that can do in their lives. Titus chapter 2, verse 11. Paul said, for the grace of God has appeared. Of course, he's talking about Christ. The grace of God has appeared that offers salvation to all people. This hope that Christ brings, the coming that we celebrate, this, this advent that we'll celebrate in just a few weeks, is a sufficient hope. It is available for all people. Now, we know the sad reality is that not all people will accept it. Not all people will have that hope in their lives. Many, many, Jesus said, will reject it. But it is a sufficient hope. And it's not just sufficient for all people. It's sufficient for all circumstances. The Hebrew writer said in Hebrews chapter 6, verse 19, this hope we have as an anchor for our souls. That no matter how strong the winds may be, no matter how fierce the, the waves may kick up, no matter what is taking place, our hope is an anchor. The hope in Christ is sufficient. As Paul said, your grace is sufficient for me. It's a sufficient hope. And so we look to the, the God of hope as the source of our hope. We, we realize the hope that he brings, the hope that has come in Christ is sufficient for all people. It's sufficient for all circumstances. And there's a reason for that. Because of the sustaining power of hope. This is, this is where we can experience in our lives. There is this sustaining power of hope. Do you notice how we said it there in verse 13? May the God of hope that's the source of it. Fill you with joy and peace in believing so you will abound in hope, the sufficiency of it, by the power of the Holy Spirit. That's the sustaining power of this hope. Listen, this, we, we don't experience this hope in our lives because we just will ourselves to. Or because we, we have a positive attitude or a good outlook on life. Where I've pulled myself up by my bootstraps and I'm just going to get on what needs to be done next. That's not why we experience this, this hope in our lives. It's sustained through the, the power of the Holy Spirit. Well, let's be honest, many times we don't feel that way, right? He talks about this abounding, overflowing hope. And even believers, many times we don't feel that way, do we? We don't feel like we have an abounding hope, but sometimes we feel spiritually weak. We feel absolutely powerless, and let's be honest with ourselves, sometimes that's the way it feels, right? And I think a big part of the problem is what we think hope is. When you and I usually use that word hope, we use it like this. We say, well, I, I hope it doesn't rain on Saturday, or I hope it does snow on Saturday. Or we say things like, I hope this, or I hope that will take place. So that's how we usually use the word. And we don't really know what's going to happen. And we don't really know whether it's going to rain on Saturday or not. And it, with us being right here at the base of the mountains, the weathermen don't even really know whether it's going to rain on Saturday or not. And so when we use the word like that and we say, I hope this is going to take place, we don't really know. There's this strong element of doubt, right? I'm hoping that will happen. I have no reason to hope that will happen. I just hope that it does. There's a strong element of doubt the way we usually use it. 
But when the Bible speaks of hope, the words that the Bible uses, both, both Old Testament and New, they're different words, Hebrew and Greek, but they both mean the same thing. They talk of confidence. They talk of security. They talk of no doubt, no concern. There's no doubt in the biblical concept of hope. Now, let me just say a few words about how we can make that a reality. Because that's not often where we live. Paul is praying for the church in Rome that they would abound, overflow in this hope by the power of the Holy Spirit. He's praying that. We're, we pray that for each other. That prayer is applicable to us, but the reality is we don't always experience that. So let me just say a few words about how we make that a reality. Because I realize that some of you are in the midst of some very difficult things right now. And when you're in the midst of those, when you're in the eye of the storm, it's hard to see hope. It's hard to see past the, 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 the clouds that are swirling around you when you're in the middle of that. Some of you are in some very difficult circumstances. And I'm not naive to think that overflowing hope is easy to experience and easy to make a reality in each and every situation. So how is it that we can rely on this and experience this overflowing hope? If hope is going to be real, it's got to be based on something real. We looked at those things in this world that, that promise hope, the hope mirages of this world. They're not, the hope that they promise is not based on anything real. Oh, yes, the raise is real, the money is real, but the hope that it promises is not. The, that the promotion is real, and that's a very real thing that comes, but the hope that it promises is not. And that relationship, the hope that it promises, is not. If hope is going to be real and experienced in a real way, it has to be based and grounded and founded in something that is real and can provide hope. The God of hope, his track record of promise keeping, that's real. That's a, that's a reality we can count on. The spirit of power, those are objective realities. That's why Paul starts with those. Because if we're going to experience this overflowing hope, we have to look at these objective realities. Listen, our feelings can be manipulated, right? Circumstances, situations, things happen, and our feelings are easily manipulated. Our emotions are easily high and easily low. We can't count on those. But these things are objective realities. They're not shaped by us. They're not shaped by our experience. We are shaped by them. And hope, if we're going to have real and lasting, unmovable, overflowing hope, it's not based on how we feel. We often think about that. We, we, I ask, you know, it's not always, always how we feel like we have this overflowing hope. We often feel spiritually weak. We often feel spiritually powerless. But the reality is that's not true. We have a God of hope that we can rely on. We have a, a God who has given us his spirit of power that can give us this abounding hope. That's the objective reality. We have to come back to the truth. Not base our hope on how we feel, but what is true. And hope is built on faith. Hope is built on that truth of who God is and how he provides hope in our lives, how he keeps promises and how that gives us hope. It's also based on faith. He said, I, fill, I pray that God would fill you with all joy and peace in believing. Talking about faith. Not just recognizing the truth of who God is. Not just recognizing the truth of the promises he's kept. Not just recognizing the power in the spirit that we have. Not just recognizing those as realities, but living them. Living them as though they are real. Stepping out in our lives as though those things are already true. Experiencing them. For the unbeliever, the sad reality is the only hope that they have in this world are those hope mirages. Those things that cannot fulfill. That's the only hope that an unbeliever has in this world. Those mirages of hope. And beyond the grave, there is no hope for one who is not trusted in Christ. That passage back in Ephesians chapter 2, verse 12, without Christ, we were without hope. That's the reality for the unbeliever. No second chances, no mitigating circumstances. The Bible says it's appointed for man once to die and then the judgment. 
And for the unbeliever, we talk about hope, and the only thing they can think about are the, the, the worldly definitions of hope. There's no hope in this world or that beyond the grave, but faith in Christ changes all of that. We put our our trust in Christ. It changes all of that. That hope that he has brought is good news for all people. Ephesians chapter 2 said we are saved by grace through faith. That's the doorway that opens the the opportunity for hope to be in the, the unbeliever's life. You and I were there once. And for the believer, faith feeds hope. Would you notice again how he he says this? He says that we I pray that the God of hope would be would be fill you with all joy and peace in believing so that you would abound in hope. That's a purpose statement. This is why God's going to do this so that you will overflow in hope. And here's here's his logic that hope in the God of hope, hope in the promises that God makes and his faithfulness to keep them that produces this fruit of joy that produces this fruit of peace and the fruit of joy and peace is there for a reason and what's the reason that we would abound in more hope in that god who fulfills his promises and that it would it would produce more joy and more peace and in that we would overflow more with hope and do you see the cycle it feeds itself faith is in our lives for the believer faith feeds hope as we trust in god and who who he is and what he's doing I'm indebted to John Piper for this last thought on how to make this a reality. That's a grounded in truth. We have to rely on faith as a reality to bring this hope to be. But Pipe, John Piper points out that most of us live in seasons of relief and seasons of suffering. That's the way life is, right? It's sort of this roller coaster at times. There are seasons of relief and seasons of suffering. I was talking to somebody recently who was going through some very hard times, some very, very difficult challenges, dark days in her life. And this is what she said. She said, I find it hard to read the Bible or pray during those times. And that, it's not just the way it is at times. When times are tough or times are dark, that's some, sometimes those are the hardest times for us to say, I'm going to get back in God's world. I'm going to spend time in prayer. Sometimes that is the reality. The seasons of relief are those times, Piper says, when, when you and I need to use all the means that God has, all that he has given us to prepare for the seasons of suffering. We don't, we don't prepare for the battle in the midst of the battle. You know, we don't wait till the bullets start to fly and say, you know, I better figure out how to use this thing. That's not the time for us to prepare. We prepare for the battle before the bullets start to fly. And he says we, we need to use those seasons of relief as times so that we can prepare for the seasons of suffering. If you're in a season of relief right now, praise God. Use that as a time of preparation, reminding yourself of his promises, of who he is as the God of hope. Remind yourself of his track record. Read those those wonderful stories we have of how he came through in, in the lives of all those Old Testament saints, how he came through, those are reminders for us of his promise keeping. Remind yourself of who the Spirit is. Remind yourself of what he does, the reality that he is in your life. Allow those truths to feed and strengthen your faith. In a moment, we're going to celebrate the Lord's Supper. As we come around this table and we celebrate, it's a commemoration of of Jesus is coming, a commemoration of the reason that he came. He came for the cross, why he came, and and what he did that gave us hope. That's what the Lord's Supper is. As we enter this Advent season, let me ask you, do you have this kind of hope, this abounding, overflowing hope? Do you have it? And will you reach out and trust him today so that your life can abound in his hope? Would you pray with me this morning? Father, we thank you. Lord, we thank you for the opportunity that we have to gather together today to celebrate this hope that you have given us. 
to be reminded of the things that you have written in the past that are given to us for encouragement and to build hope. To be reminded of who you are. And Father, in these next moments as we gather around your table, we celebrate the coming of Christ, the reason why you sent your Son, that we might have life and have it more abundantly. He came for the cross, and Father, we thank you Lord, prepare our hearts as we come to celebrate. Help us to use this as a memorial. Christ shed blood and his broken body on the cross for us that we might have forgiveness of sins. Lord, would you bless these next few moments, we pray in Jesus' name.